Welcome to episode number 269 of Destination Linux. Whether you're brand new to open source or a guru of sudo, this is the podcast for you. My name is Ryan. I'm Jill. And I'm Michael. On this week's episode of Destination Linux, we're going to be discussing lesser known browsers. Which ones are worthy for you to be checking out? Then we're going to take a look at the latest innovations coming from VLC. Plus, we have our tips, tricks, and software picks. All of this coming up right now on Destination Linux. Before we get started this week, I just want to make a quick announcement that this is the last episode is going to be published on the main channel. We have our new show channel for Destination Linux. So if you are not subscribed to that, you need to subscribe right now to get updates to the next episodes. We'll have a link in the show notes and in the description of this video. And all of the shows are getting their own YouTube channel, and that's because we want to break it out so everyone can become fans of each one and you get the feeds directly when they have a new show drop. So make sure you're checking out for ways to subscribe to all the new channels. And the main DL channel that's been there before, that's where all your clips are going to be. So you can check out highlights from all the shows. Nice. All right. In our community feedback this week, it comes from Michael, not our Michael. At least we don't know yet. It depends how much they talk about KDE and stools and stuff. We'll see. We don't think it's our <laughs> Michael in this case. They go on to say, hello, DLN. Once again, writing in, just wanted to chime in on the topic of FOSS or FLOSS, as Jill stated. I'm in agreement that we need to clarify what the expectations of the community are in the financial or other ways to contribute. Perhaps rebranding free software is in order. Michael's idea of Libra is a good idea, in my opinion. Plus, it would be a cool name for a distro Libra Linux. Personally speaking, I'm on a fixed income and cannot afford to make financial contribution to the projects I use. Though, since I do administer servers and develop, I try to contribute with ideas and bug reports. Also, open source to me means take and use my code, but it does not mean take it and call it yours. Also, if you make a change which benefits the project as a whole, you ought to share it with the team and IIRC. There is a clause in the GPL that states you own your code, but will be included in all releases going forward. Just my two cents. Great show as always. I do appreciate all three of you. To Jill Hugs, Michael and Ryan, a hearty handshake. Thank you. Regards, Michael. Why does... Jill get the Aww. hug and we yeah, just get why don't we get hugs? I like I mean, hugs too. Yeah, hugs are fun. We received a lot of great feedback on this latest episode, uh, not only from developers, but community members talking about the importance of giving back. I love the statement that while they can't contribute financially, which everybody's situation is different and that makes sense. That's one of the advantages of open source is that ability to close the digital divide for people who can't afford software financially, but they are finding other ways to support the projects with the talents that they have. That could be writing documentation, that could be doing art, that could be bug reports or developing code or just being a part of the community and helping out. Or again, like we mentioned last week, sending thank you notes. All of that stuff is a great way to contribute back to a project. So I love the email um, kind of just refocusing on some of the things we touched on in that episode. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree that all developers, you know, need to be sharing their changes and all that sort of stuff because when you create a fork of something or derivative of something, you can help the original one by sharing that code and that's one of the reasons why I like to see code being released with GPL or something re relative to it because it means that they're going to have to be releasing that code in the same kind of way, which is always great to see. Although when it says the email says that uh, also open source to me means take and use my code, but it does not mean take it and call it yours. You could kind of do that too. You can take open source and then kind of rebrand it and stuff like that. So it does matter which license you're using. And if you want to learn more about licensing, you can check out our episode License to Thrill of Destination Linux, where we talked about the different licensing of what software. A great name, License to Thrill. You did good on that yeah. one, Michael. <laughs> that was one. really awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And since uh, Michael talked about the word Libra in his email, I wanted to give a little example of where I use Libra and uh, what the actual definition of it is. So at my organization and Linux user group, the Linux Chicks of Los Angeles, we actually prefer to use the word FLOSS or free Libra open source software in our mission statement. Our mission statement states, be polite, be helpful, a community for and by women interested in FLOSS. So in the dictionary, the term Libra means the most common Spanish adjective for free, but it isn't used to refer to something that is available without charge or cost. For that, the word to use almost always is 
gratis. So That's you know, that was really interesting. So literally and the definition fits what we were, what Michael's yeah, suggestion of the word would be. Absolutely. Yeah. That's nice. And also the word Libra in French and Spanish mm -hmm. means free, having liberty, liberty or at liberty. So it, you know, it has many meanings in that one word, but it doesn't necessarily mean free. <laughs> as, <laughs> as yeah, and then you don't have to have the saying free as in <laughs> yeah. uh, freedom, not yeah. free as in beer uh, yeah. when you're using that. So there you go. That's our big push on the show is to move from free software boss to Libra to software. Libra software. There you go. Yeah. Well, Michael, thank you for your email. We love hearing from our worldwide community. What we want you to do is get the official deal in mug, fill it with some coffee or bubbly, sit down on the nearest stool and send an email to comments at destinationlinux.org. And if you want to join in the community discussion, then join the deal in community forum by going to dealinforum.com. This episode of Destination Linux is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Cloud computing can be, let's say, complex. But standing up reliable, affordable cloud infrastructure really doesn't have to be. At DigitalOcean, you get in a comprehensive portfolio of compute, storage, database, and networking products to put your cloud infrastructure in capable hands so you and your teams can get back to do what matters most, building world-changing apps that grow your business. And DigitalOcean also offers tons of great features like predictable pricing, robust product docs, the amount of tutorials that they have are thousands, and they're all fantastic, and they keep them updated, which is... You kind of rare and when you look at tutorials online they keep them updated and that is super important and they also have tons of other great services so go to do.co slash tux 2022 to get started with your account on DigitalOcean. and if you get started with that url you get a 100 dollars free credit that's right a hundred dollar free credit just by going to do.co slash tux 2022. So you get all of the things I mentioned, and you also get the compatibility with their infrastructure to, regardless of your size of your team, whether you have a team of one or teams of a thousand people, you can use their simple, powerful cloud computing and grow at DigitalOcean. And as a listener of the Destination Linux podcast and a member of the DLN community, remember, go to do.co slash tux2022 to get your free $100 credit on DigitalOcean's awesome cloud platform. Thanks again to DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of Destination Linux. So I'm so excited to share this topic with you guys because I originally dreamed up, let's talk about all of the lesser known browsers out there. Then when I was doing the research for the episode, realized just how many there actually are and kind of kicked myself for wanting to do this topic, but then again, <laughs> fell in love with it again once I started yes. looking at all of them. So on this show, we've talked about Firefox, Chrome, Opera, Vivaldi, Brave, the more well-known browsers. And each time we get comments from the community saying, but what about Waterfox? What about this other lesser known browser? So this is the episode where we spent all week diving into these other browsers. In fact, we're checking out LibreWolf, Pale Moon, Waterfox, Epiphany, Falcon, Icecast, Sea Monkey, and Conqueror, all to see which of these browsers are as good or better than the bigger names out there. So Michael, I know this was a big test. You had to download a <laughs> lot of different browsers. I want to start with you and ask a couple questions. How did okay. your testing go this week with these other lesser known browsers? And I guess what is your biggest surprise and what was your biggest disappointment when you were looking at these browsers? Okay, so that's interesting. So first of all, you say we're going to talk about all these browsers. I actually talked about. I actually lo looked at a, a few more as well, just just because. Oh wow! Okay. But uh, for the your overachiever, question, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but the biggest surprise for me is probably that some of these still exist, and the biggest disappointment for me is that some of these still exist. And because there's some that don't that don't seem to have updates for years and others yeah. that seem like they don't like they look like they're from the you know early 2000s, maybe the 90s. So they, it's, it's a pro and con that they exist because there is a, a, a value to it. But through my experience, I did find some uh, some just some browsers that I prefer over the others. There was a few I got mail moments when I was looking like AOL. I felt like it was going <laughs> to pop up like they were very 90s looking, I think would be the right term. So, I mean, which one did you end up liking the most out of those? Well, if we're going to um, give Mike a top two or top three, I'd say that yeah. 
Uh, Lieber Wolf was one of the top options because it's it reminded me very much of Firefox and all the value of Firefox with a little bit of extra stuff on top. Uh, I also liked uh, the Epiphany GNOME Web for specific reasons. And we'll get to that a little bit when we get to that, t- that browser. Uh, and also, I was a fan of Falcon. So I've actually used Falcon as my secondary browser for a little while. So I already kind of had a little bit of experience with it. But so far, I'd say LibreWolf, uh, Falcon, and Epiphany. Okay, Jill, I know you are the positive force on this team. <laughs> so it's hard for you to use the word disappointment. But yeah. I still have to ask, <laughs> what was your biggest surprise looking at all these browsers? What was your biggest disappointment? Well, I think with LibreWolf, I was actually surprised that they only had one add-on and extension by default, the uBlock Origin. Yeah. I, for some reason, thought there was more there, kind of like the Garuda web browser. It has a lot more uh, security add-ons installed. Yeah. So I was a little surprised there. Probably I, I was happy that Pale Moon actually had uh, support, still had support for Silverlight, Flash, and Java. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. But but disappointment, Jill. Disappointment. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well. <laughs> Give us a I negative, Jill. Say honestly, something bad about something. Honestly, I wasn't disappointed <laughs> with any of them. Jill I thought can't. They... <laughs> she can't. She what she said that her disappointment is that there's not more browsers to look at. There, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I I did look at uh, quite a few more that aren't on our list. Oh, good. And, I can't wait to um, hear about some of those. <laughs> yeah. So, but I love my my favorites in the list are actually Sea Monkey because I like the old school Netscape look, okay. and uh, GNOME Web. Interesting mm-hmm. choices there. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> So for for me, I really fell in love with LibreWolf and Waterfox. Those were the two that yes. just kind of nice. blew me away in, in, in a great way. Now, it's not that I hadn't checked these out in the past, but I never really spent time with them. And I think if you get nothing out of this main topic, it's go check out these other browsers that may not have the big advertising budget as some of the ones that you're more familiar with, because there's some amazing work going on in here. And these two were the ones that fit my personal use case for browsers and everybody's use case is different. So while I may look at SeaMonkey and I did and go, this looks like I'm waiting for an AOL prompt. It's very old looking. Jill is a perfect (laughs) example said, I love it. I want all of that. And we'll talk about some of the pros and cons and why you want to make that decision. But LibreWolf is very special to me because One of the things that we do for our patrons is we pipe in audio. We have two services, Video Ninja and Jitsi. And in Jitsi is where all of our patrons during the show get to watch without the delay and they get to hang out with us in the after show and things. And I have to pipe that audio in between two browsers with Video Ninja. So you got Video Ninja in one, Jitsi in the other. And so I use QJack CTL to do that and to build that bridge. One of the problems that I ran into is that certain changes were happening in browsers where every single person that would join, say, Jitsi would get their own audio stream, which means I have to pipe each single person in individually and try to pipe them in. And then it started causing issues with my audio and everything else. I asked Michael randomly before a show, I was like, give me a browser based on Firefox. And he threw out LibreWolf. And what's interesting is because it has Jack support built in, LibreWolf, It shows independently from my Firefox browser where Video Ninja is sitting, which means my pipe input and output is just a perfect run, the input to the output and the outputs to the input. And it's a perfect stream of audio because it shows up as LibreWolf instead of, say, Firefox or something else there. Nice. So to me, I instantly fell in love because it's allowed us to not only pipe video into Jitsi, but allows me to pipe all the audio in to be able to do this show. And so for that... LibreWolf, I love you. Also, <laughs> I tested that with Waterfox, though, and Waterfox does the same thing. In, in QJack CTL, Waterfox shows up separately as Waterfox. So if I open two Firefox browsers to put this oh, into perspective, great. it would yeah. be hard to know which audio stream goes where and where I'm piping things. But because they name themselves and they have built-in Jack support, I don't have to do that. One of the disappointments is I need browsers that are usable across all platforms, Linux, Mac, and Windows. I don't like my systems having different software if I'm on... Uh, one of the MacBooks, or I'm in Windows, or I'm doing something with the kids' computers, I want to be able to use the same browser everywhere. And some of these browsers do not support all the systems there. So that would be number one. And the number two thing I was disappointed in 
is not having mobile apps. None of these options we're talking about have a mobile app at all. And I like yeah. to use the same thing like I do all my computers and different operating systems. I like to use my mobile apps have the same browser as well. And so that was a little bit of a disappointment for me. And then finally, see, Jill, I'm going to make up for your disappointment because I've got a whole <laughs> list. Just a list. Uh, my disappointment was with GNU IceCat not being oh, updated okay. since 2019. Yeah. Now that's, true. we, we yeah. checked this. I even had Jill, you check it. Michael, mm -hmm. you checked it. There's no update yeah. since 2019, but they're not saying it's deprecated. And to me, this is potentially a security nightmare because it'd be very irresponsible to have a browser out there that you haven't updated in years, but that people go and say, hey, I like GNU stuff. I want to use GNU or I follow the GNU Foundation. So I'm going to go and download this browser and not be having those security patches. So I can't say for 100% they're not updating it. All I can tell you is that when you click download the latest version, it's from 2019. It says last updated there. So I can't validate that in their code, but very weird. This is a, a super interesting and kind of funny ex ex situation and experience that we decided to do this <laughs> test when we did. Because when we did this test about with trying IceCAD, we all basically found that it was not updated. And then right before the show, I decided to search if it was updated just in case. And yes, it was updated like two or three days ago. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, but I will still say <laughs> that the point about the difference between uh, two and a half years for an update is still too long. So even though it's been updated now, I don't really think that counts necessarily. No, because so. you're talking about a browser. <laughs> like there, there was, there were mitigations nearly every week now. And it's only going to get worse because of the government sponsored hacking and all of that stuff. But I mean, there, there are mitigations, I think just last week with Firefox, if not this week, mm -hmm. there are mitigations constantly happening and updating once a year, once every six months, once every three months is too long. Yeah, It's too long in there. And so to me, I think they're putting their users at risk with that. that. That's my opinion. It seems like that's what's happening. Unless they're doing something behind the scenes I'm not aware of. I would just wanted to make sure if people go look it up, you will see an update. Depending on your distro, you'll see an update. Not all of them have yeah. updates, but some of them do. And it was just kind of like, what are the odds that that's when, right when we're about to talk about it, it changes. Well, that happens a lot with things mm -hmm. we talk about. When we talk about it on the show, then all of a sudden the companies <laughs> yeah. will go and fix it and then go, nah, -uh. and we're like, look, we got a date stamp <laughs> there that yeah. shows otherwise. All right, so let's get into some of these that we like. So LibreWolf is a fork of Firefox. It's focused on privacy, security, and freedom. So that's their big tagline. There's no telemetry. It's got private search. And as Jill mentioned, uBlock Origin is included the way they build this is it's built from the latest Firefox stable source for up-to-date security and features. So you get all the stuff that Firefox is doing with their source code, but then they go and remove the telemetry. They have a private search by default and those type of things. It's available as a flat pack, but wasn't in the Fedora repository itself. And we mentioned being integrated beautifully with QJack. I like LibreWolf mm -hmm. a lot. Like I could use this thing as my main browser all day long. Anybody else? Want to comment yeah, on some I, of the things about LibreWolf? Yeah, I like LibreWolf a lot also because of the security aspect. And I've actually been using it more, Ryan, since you said uh, months ago that it works really well with yeah. Jack because I use Jack too. So I've been really enjoying that and that it, that it shows its name in Pavu Control and uh, QJack. It shows the correct name, not just Firefox. <laughs> yeah. It's so nice. Yeah, that is, that is very important. <laughs> I yeah. think that LibreWolf is is a great browser. It's it, when in terms of like what I was looking for, um, I am a big fan of Firefox. I've made that very clear probably a hundred times now. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that uh, Firefox is a fantastic browser, and I've always wanted to see mm -hmm. the forks that exist to be uh, based on a fork of Firefox. So when LibreWolf came out, I was like, okay, this would be cool. Let's see what it is. And I didn't really get around to testing it for a while. When Ryan asked what browser to do, it's the one that popped in my head because like, I knew it was a thing that was based on Firefox, but I hadn't tried it. So I'm glad that my suggestion worked out. 
because I had no idea. And now that yeah. we are talking about it on the show, uh, I did take the time to test it out, and I w- I'm very pleasantly surprised that it is as good as Firefox. It's they're, they're keeping up to date with what Firefox is doing, and mm-hmm. they have an, another approach to do different things. So they don't they they remove certain uh, pieces that Firefox does. They add extra stuff as well, and they make some different configuration changes. So overall, I think LibreWolf is a fantastic alternative. And I would be fine with making it my secondary, in fact. So Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, and I also want to give a shout out to the web developers of LibreWolf. They have one of the best looking websites. It's very clean. Nice. It feels modern. I don't feel like I'm using a project that's made by somebody in their spare time. It could be. I don't know. But it doesn't feel that way because <laughs> the website is so well done and put together. Everything that I want, the main features are right there on the web page. It's very easy to understand. It gives me a lot of faith in this product when I when I look at it. I just want a mobile app. So LibreWolf, the community, maybe we can help get a mobile app going on on Android and iOS there. Now I'm surprised nobody mentioned Pale Moon as one of their favorites. It's a Guana based web browser. Mm-hmm. It's forked from mature Mozilla code. It provides the group navigation but- buttons, bookmarks, enabled by default, tabs the next page. So they kind of took some of the things that people liked in the old Firefox, I think, and kept them as their defaults uh, versus changing. I wasn't a huge fan of Pale Moon because there's no flat pack, wasn't in even in the Endeavor Arch repository. I had to use the AR- AUR to get it. It wasn't in Fedora either, no Mac support, no platform support. So that's why that one kind of fell off for me. Well, the way that Pale Moon, um, they do the old style of Firefox. Like, well, Firefox still does this. You can go download the tarball, uh, and it's basically a tar.gz, probably. It's sometimes tar.bz2. Yeah. Uh, and you just download that, extract it, and then you have a binary that you can launch. And that's how Pale, Pale Moon does it. So that's what I did when I got the application. I just downloaded their tarball, and then I loaded it that way. So I, I do think that oh, there is... Oh, you're so fancy, Michael. <laughs> the, this is, I, I want a flat too, pack. Am I that, I'm just lazy now. Like, if it doesn't have a flat <laughs> pack, I'm like, eh, whatever. To be clear, <laughs> I searched for app images, flat packs, and snaps, and, and Fedora repo versions way before I did the tarball thing. Okay, I, wanted, right. I wanted to do the other ones, but the, I knew, like, as a last resort, I said I figured they probably have a tarball. Since you're so fancy. Well, <laughs> it's tarball. just because I already knew these things, but it's not very intuitive. I will say that. And mm. but anyway, so P- Pale Moon is interesting because it's based on Firefox, but it it does feel like it's from Firefox many many years ago, <laughs> and that's what I like about it. <laughs> so there are <laughs> the fact that it's based on Zool, which is X U L, is you know there are people who want Zool based add ons and things like that. So I could be like, okay, fair enough, but it also doesn't render modern JavaScript accurately. So that in itself is a problem for me. But and for, if for those who don't need JavaScript and like to turn it off, maybe that doesn't matter. So Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we all agree that Waterfox, though, was one that we loved. And that's the next on the list. You get the no telemetry. It supports extensions. This was one of the coolest things. From the Chrome Web Store and Firefox add-on store mm-hmm. and the Opera extension store. So if you're one of those people who like extensions, which if you watch my videos, I'll tell you, stop installing all the extensions because they create security holes in your browser. But if you ignore that anyways, and you just <laughs> like installing tons of extensions and creating security holes in the browser, the cool thing about this is you got extensions from any store you want that you can install here. That's yeah. interesting. I, I didn't notice that part. I didn't notice that the fact that it worked on all the extensions because like, how do they, how do they don't make- know. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> they're not automatically compatible because there is like they both use the they all use the same web extensions thing. But it's kind of interesting that they say that it'll work just fine. It's one of their main features that they talk about right on their front page. Chrome, Firefox and Opera web extensions. Somehow uh, I missed that. Work. <laughs> I don't know. How. Yeah. So that that to me is is very cool. But I just like the look of Waterfox overall. Yeah. System one, by the way, owns this browser. Uh, there. It mm-hmm. has search partnerships, so that's how they make money. One of the things I tell you about companies is go and see how they, they make money in there. So the default search on Waterfox is monetized, but they tell you you're on no obligation to use it. You can switch the default search if you want to something else, but if you want to support Waterfox, you can use their default search and then you're going to have some monetized ads and things that will show up in there. This one also was not in the Fedora repository, also didn't have a flat pack. So I think those are things that I would like to see in in additional support, of course, for mobile OS as well. But I think all three of us really liked Waterfox as an option. Yeah. 
Um, there is an app image, though, of uh, Water Fox on App Image Hub. Uh, Hub. Nice. And one thing I wanted to say is I've actually been using Fo Water Fox on and off for many years. Um, and there are now two versions of Water Fox. Water Fox Classic, which I, re I have recently used. And then there's uh, Water Fox Current, or, or it's called Water Fox G4, which G4 has a more modern, focused on modern web compatibility with good speed and a nice balance of privacy and usability. But I like w Water Fox Classic because it has the layout of an older version of Firefox. <laughs> you like the I, browsers I like. with patina in them, don't you, Jill? You yeah. like that old school feel that I, are inside there. That's cool. I like yeah. that you like that. It's very different. Yeah. I always look for that modern stuff, but you have appreciation <laughs> for the old, which I think is awesome. I like Waterfox a lot. There's a lot of value to it, especially the that the and turns out in the live chat, uh, Neil's letting us know that the reason why they have support is because of the new manifest for the extensions are all kind of using the same version, which is why they should be compatible. So that's cool. Um, now I'm, I'm curious if I can get Chrome extensions to work in Firefox. <laughs> but uh, the one thing that it was kind of confusing to me is there was a couple things that were confusing when I was using Waterfox, and maybe it's just like they they missed some kind of step here. But on the about page, when you list Waterfox Limited as the company who made it, when you click it, it takes you to the Mozilla website, and that's just really confusing. So oh. um, it might make people think that that's you know it's made by Mozilla even though it's not because it, it is technically based on Firefox, right? But you know that sort of thing. Uh, the other thing is that you talked about how on the front page it says no telemetry. Right next to that, it says limit limited data collection. Right next to each other. So I'm very confused. Probably because of the search results, the default search. I'm well, guessing. they do they do yeah. list what the what the, the, the collection stuff is doing, um, but so it is taking some information. But telemetry doesn't mean tracking; it just means taking information that you can provide by the system. So that's why I was more of like they should just change it to no tracking because they're not watching what you're doing. Whereas telemetry uh, yeah. and data collection are kind of the same. Well, maybe they'll update their site as soon as they hear this episode here. That'd be cool. And then. We have Epiphany Gnome Web. Now, I know why I would like this because mm -hmm. I'm a Gnome liker, but I was surprised both of you. Well, I know Jill uses Gnome a little bit too, but Michael, especially, you liked this? You like Epiphany <laughs> and Gnome Web? I do. I do. What? Uh, as a KDE Plasma uh, fan, uh, maybe a fan, we could, we, could, we could say, you know, diehard. You know, fanboy. Like, yeah. yeah, fanboy. Yeah, whatever. All of those things are true. So, um, yes. I do like Epiphany. I think Gnome Web slash Epiphany. For those who don't know, Epiphany is like the the code name, the application name, and Gnome Web is what you see when you actually look, search for it in your main system. So it'll basically say both, depending on where you look. But I like to call it Epiphany because it's more clear. <laughs> but Epiphany mm -hmm. is a browser that is kind of minimal. It has a lot of uh, interesting uh, features and stuff like that. But I think that the it has a feature that a lot of people are not aware of, and that's what makes it the most interesting to me. So it's it's minimal in the amount of features it has, but it also has one which is basically individualized session web apps. This is very very powerful. Now what I mean by that is compare it to Firefox with the multi containers app thing or multi account containers. You can say that they're similar in the sense that there is a multiple set, individualized sessions for those things. The way that that GNOME Web slash Epiphany does it is that they have a web app store. So you, when you create a web app, it actually creates a specific window for that application with that session. So you can create that and then store it on your main system to launch it. And you basically create your own web app interface application thing. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. But it's, mm -hmm. it is kind of hidden inside of the application. It also matters how you install the application. So if you install it from your repo, that feature will be there. If you install it from the Flatpak, it will not. But they are working on making the Flatpak version have that functionality in the future. So I'm excited for that part. But that's one of my favorite reasons to use it because it essentially... Welcome to Gnome, Michael. Yes. <laughs> Okay. It well, starts I mean, with the browser, I mean, then we take over your desktop. It's I mean, happen. I'm still using Epiphany on, on Plasma, but you know, <laughs> it is a it is a good browser, especially for that feature. I I'm a big fan of that feature, and I would I would love to see more more browsers do that. And and yeah. for, before anyone you know responds in the comments or sends an email about this, Chromium slash Chrome and anything based on it, do not do this. What they do is create a Chrome app 
but it's the same session as the browser. So if you make three of the same app or the same web app, it's the exact same login across all of them, including your browser. Whereas Gnome Web slash Epiphany is an individual session per web app. So you can have multiple accounts logged in to each one. That's the, that's the difference. I Just, love how you went and proactively attacked the um actually comments that we would well, every get there. time I've ever <laughs> mentioned this that. part. I every, love that. Yeah, I just okay. I just feel like it's gonna so, happen. So, yeah. Yeah. so I actually run uh, Gnome Gnome uh, Web in Windowmaker, <laughs> so that's where I tested it. <laughs> nice. So it, it is actually one of the most underrated browser, like Michael was saying. And and it is fast and nimble and fully integrated into GNOME. And it's very, very easy to use. In fact, it has two separate areas where there's settings. They have a more minimal, minimal settings hamburger menu. And then they have a more uh, one with more details as well that's kind of hidden out of the way. Mm -hmm. Epiphany really has the minimal feel of a browser for reading the web and documentation. And I'm sure that's a lot of the reasons why the GNOME developers wanted a web browser. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it actually, the name Epiphany, it was Epiphany from 2002 to 2012. So it's been GNOME web for a long time, but... I'm used to calling it Epiphany, and they do still call the project Epiphany. <laughs> well, I, I would just like to suggest to the GNOME team to consider going back to Epiphany as the name of it. Yes, because, I agree. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason, the, I'm not sure, I'm curious if you if you th if you have, your reason is the same as mine, but the reason I have it is because the SEO and the searchability on search engines is 100%. impossible. <laughs> oh, yeah. So yeah, if, GNOME Web is not a good name. They need to go back to Epiphany. Yeah. Epiphany, by the way, is a fantastic name. I really like yeah. it. it. It would help with your SEO. It would help with its popularization. It would help know people know that they're using a different browser uh, and what browser that they're using out there. So I 100% agree. We need, yeah. we need to do that. Yeah. Oh, it also had Firefox Sync. And that was one of the things I was surprised about because I had never really looked yes, at that before. That was oh, that's cool, cool too. Yeah. That yeah. was surprised because Epiphany yeah. is it's based on WebKit. It uses WebKit yeah. powered by WebKit. So that makes it mm -hmm. different than some of these other ones we're talking about. Now I thought Apple developed WebKit, but you corrected me in that. So moment. there there's a lot of th the Apple is a was basically in partly developing of, of WebKit, then they eventually took it over. And then there's a lot of other things. And I do want to get to the history of something, but I want to wait till we get to the thing that actually like is the the core okay. of where it all comes from. But there, mm -hmm. but WebKit mm -hmm. is the also the predecessor to Blink, which is the Chrome, Chrome engine. And yeah. so it's it's still being maintained in that sort of thing. But I agree that it was kind of cool that Firefox Sync was uh, added to this because you expect it with LibreWolf and you expect it with Waterfox. But with Epiphany, it's just nice to see that as an option. It plays YouTube videos actually really super quick. And I realized that was one of the reasons why I like the Epiphany browser so much. And so I actually played a lot of our previous episodes of Destination Linux on it. And it's nice. just because it's super smooth. I hear <laughs> it's perfect for playing episodes of Destination Linux. On yes, yes. I heard. All of these browsers I hear <laughs> are perfect for Destination Linux, which is, just it, shows yes, how compatible absolutely. this show is. And if you want to <laughs> if you want to verify that those statements, be sure to check out all the browsers while including the episodes of Destination Linux in those to do the full test. All 236 <laughs> you want to test because one of those episodes <laughs> might not work and we need that feedback. We so need that feedback. Watch them all. Sure. Watch them all. Uh, the next one on the list is, oh, I do want to mention real quick, uh, it's, Built-in ad blocker, intelligent tracking prevention as well. And, of course, the very simplicity we talk about with the Epiphany or GNOME Web. Falcon was really quick for me to remove off my list because as soon as I installed it uh, in Fedora GNOME, the submenu items from the hamburger showed up on the left side when I clicked the hamburger menu on the right side. And I'm like, well, now you're dead to me. So there's some optimization issues well, that need to be Well, there we go. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I, I ran it as a snap in Ubuntu Mate, and it ran fine for me. <laughs> I well, don't remember how I, I you, wanted Jill. to test it with a snap. <laughs> so. I don't know how I installed it, but I'm going to check real quick. Find but it. you're in KDE, not GNOME, so I don't know if it was a GNOME thing or if it was distro specific to Fedora, but... Yeah. It's it an was interesting a question. I don't know if yeah. like what caused that issue because I it was totally fine with me. Uh, I was using Falcon. Um, I've been using Falcon for a long of time. Of course, because it's KDE. Since they first made it, well, actually, I also was using it when it was Quapzilla, 
And uh, mm-hmm. when they trans- transitioned to Falcon, to Falcon, Kitty Falcon, I was very happy to see that because it was like, this is a great browser, but it's kind of, it needs a little bit more of a, like a backing, some partnerships and sort of stuff. And then when KDE jumped in, I was like, oh, okay, this is going to be fun. So I started using it when they first released Falcon 1.0, whenever that was, I don't remember. Uh, but I like Falcon and uh, I'm very curious to see what the issue you have. If you have like, maybe um, you could send us a demo or something. I want to check it out and see if we can fix that. And also as a thing that I think is very important that we need to make sure we hold ourselves accountable. Ryan, did you submit a bug report? No. No. <laughs> I, listen, I had 15 browsers to check out yeah. in this episode. Yes, and I had to I had to put all the notes together for the show. I didn't have time. Uh, it's an excuse. You're right, just, Michael. I I'm just put a bug report in. You're right. You're so, right. Last You're night right. on Linux sal- Saloon, Michael said that you gave us a lot of homework. I did. That's I right. gave everybody that a lot of homework awesome. this A lot week. of homework. Yeah. <laughs> but it was fun. It was, it was so fun. fun homework. So yeah, I actually, that. what was interesting, I really do recommend the community go and do this. Like, check out all these browsers we're, we're talking about, because it was yeah. fascinating to kind of see everybody's different take on what they think a web browser should be. And there's a lot of a lot of these things where I may be like, I don't like this. And somebody else goes, I absolutely love it. In fact, you're going to hear that when we get to Sea Monkey with Jill and me. Like I, Sea Monkey was absolutely a no for me. Jill loves it. And <laughs> that's okay, right? It's okay that I don't like this and somebody else does like it. But I think if you don't go through that and you just assume there's just Firefox and Brave and Chrome out there, you're missing out on a lot of cool interpretations of what a web browser could be. Um, Falcon to me also... I didn't like the fact that their web page tells you absolutely nothing about it and having to write this show Mm -hmm. that really annoyed me about after the 13th browser to go check out that they say nothing about what it features, what advantages it has, why anyone should care about it. I feel like the developers put a lot of time into building this thing and they should put just a little bit of time or maybe someone from the community can go and really break out some of the advantages it has to sell it to people who aren't familiar with it. That's a very fair point. Not having mm-hmm. details about like I only I only knew what Falcon had because I knew what Quetzilla had, and I and I knew that because I had already used it. But that's not a way uh, you need to make it clear why someone should use your application, regardless of what kind of application mm-hmm. it is. Without those inform that details, you're just going to make people immediately abandon the even the concept yeah. of considering it. So the next one on the list, GNU Ice Cat, it's very simple for me. I would never use this as a browser. This is actually the only one on the list that I would never install on my machine. And that's because the update cadence, I don't trust based on what we saw, even though it was updated now, it was like two years in between Yeah, uh, for a browser. To me, that's, again, they may not be being transparent about their updates. In that case, you need to fix that or they are being transparent about it and you're not updating a browser enough, but this is a rebrand, not a fork of Firefox. And you have to make sure in a browser world that you are constantly, constantly updating. And that's what I expect to see with a browser when I'm looking through its notes. So for me, I would never touch GNU IceCat. Yeah, I would agree with that too, solely because of the update. Well, I looked into it more. I went to the Git and looked at the source code and see when the last commits were. It was interesting because you're right that they are kind of being transparent in terms of like the code, but you have to look at the code to see this. And they are it, there was an, a, a period where it was, I think it was September 2019, and then a couple days ago. And that was just like the weird timing of that is kind of funny, like we talked about earlier. But uh, I did test to see if it was available in uh, Fedora, and it is now, which is kind of funny. Uh, but I also chose to not install it for the exact same reason. Yeah. Hmm. GNU Ice Cat, it does have a very interesting history. I mean, it used to be GNU Ice Weasel. And back in 2006, Debian rebranded Mozilla Firefox to Ice Weasel. Hmm. And, I thought they uh, were yeah, separate. It, I thought Ice Cat was made by GNU and Ice Weasel was made by Debian. Uh, actually, no. Um, Ice Cat came from Ice Weasel. Oh, that's so. Yeah, so that was an interesting. I I remember following that history because I was using Ice Weasel a lot back in the day with Debian. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I I do think that Ice Cat is interesting in terms of like what their goal is to do of like because of course it's a GNU thing, so they're removing certain things that they disagree with in terms of like the free software slash Libra software thing, um, but at the same time. I mean, yeah, it's a browser. You can remove those things. That's really wonderful. But uh, update it. That would be actually more wonderful. All right. Sea Monkey. <laughs> Let's talk about Sea Monkey. Jill, Woo-hoo. I opened this thing up 
And uh, again, I was waiting for that. You got <laughs> mail prompt. It's very 90s AOL Netscape looking design, very dated for someone who's used to the more modern browsers like LibreWolf and things and their look. But it's all in one. This is like the Swiss Army knife of browsers. So tell me why Absolutely. you like Sea Monkey. Tell me why I'm wrong. I'm okay with being wrong. Okay, so yes, it is a, a, a Swiss Army knife of browsers. It's a full internet suite. It's an email client and has a news group and feed client and even an IRC chat and an HTML editor all in one browser. And it was actually created in 2005 after the Mozilla Foundation decided to focus on the standalone projects Firefox and Thunderbird. And it is actually based on the same source code, which grew out of Netscape Communicator woohoo, and formed the base <laughs> of Netscape 6 and Netscape 7. You can't cheer on your own words, Jill. <laughs> yeah. you, you can't. Oh, That's something Michael would that. do. He'd say something, go, yeah. <laughs> That's not so, yeah, would. Cool. <laughs> I have actually been using SeaMonkey a lot la lately, and I used it for our show notes today, <laughs> in fact, because nice. I've been using it so much. And I remember using SeaMonkey years ago when it came out in 2006 or so on uh, Debian. And I continued to use it for my email when the Firefox web browser and Thunderbird Mail became separate projects. I was not happy when they did that originally. Now I, I like it. I like having, you know, Thunderbird and like having Firefox. But I really liked the whole suite and, and that's what I love about this browser. And in fact, newer browsers like Vivaldi are going that way. They're they're <laughs> they're trying to create that internet suite like a Sea yeah, Monkey has. That's true. Vivaldi <laughs> definitely is doing that. A lot of that. They're incorporating everything they can into the browser again. Uh, the thing about Sea Monkey is, I, I, if I remember it correctly, when you first open it up, it actually the first prompt is like set up your email. So it yeah. almost feels like an email client that mm -hmm. you've just yeah. installed, not a browser, but that's because all of this stuff is built into one. I could see the use case for it. I didn't mm -hmm. particularly like it. I like all my stuff separate now, but I think it's kind of cool that they this is an option out there for people. This is one yeah. I definitely get that somebody say, hey, I love this thing for yes. sure. <laughs> and I love how both... The Sea Monkey default themes look like classic Netscape and old school Firefox. Because that's one of that us look. that like it. <laughs> yeah, that's and one of Sea us. Monkey <laughs> uses the Zool architecture as well because it is an an older uh, Netscape based uh, browser. So you can install all those old Firefox Fox add ons and extensions you used to love. <laughs> So but they're not is, updated necessarily. So those ones you no. used to love may be security holes. So be careful with. Very true, Ryan. Very true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry to be Debbie Downer on that one, but no, you know. that's okay. Yeah. And uh, actually, Michael and I were both happy that it includes the old IRC client Chatzilla because that's what I used to use for years for my IRC client. <laughs> yeah. So Chatzilla is one of those that is not updated, but it is kind of yeah. fun to see it there. What's interesting about Sea Monkey is that. I was I was looking into the that what they're talking about like the latest versions and that sort of stuff because see to be honest when I, you were talking about your biggest surprises Sea Monkey was still existing was one of my biggest surprises <laughs> and it was a it was really interesting to see that they in their notes about when you go to download it it says that they have a security updates from Firefox ninety one point six ESR and also Thunderbird ninety one point six ESR. And that kind of blew my mind because how does an, a, a, a Firefox fork from that long ago and a Thunderbird fork from that long ago have support for mm -hmm. the latest security updates from Pretty the awesome. ESR of now? Like, I'm not sure how technically it's even possible, but mm -hmm. they say they did it. So that's quite impressive. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was disappointed that it doesn't have ICQ built in and doesn't have AOL Messenger built in. Because if we're going to go blast the past, we need to have all of the old stuff <laughs> yeah. uh, added back in. But no, this is cool. This is very cool mm -hmm. that it exists. Uh, yeah. Moving on, Conquer. <laughs> another KDE browser. Like, Michael, what is the problem where KDE's like, we can't just have one browser. We must have two or three browsers that 
So when you ever, you know, the idea of saying, should should I have to, my snack today, should it be peanut butter or chocolate? And then the Reese's Cup decided, why not both? So why uh-huh. can't there be more items from, I actually, I do agree that there are sometimes there's a little bit of excessiveness in terms of like how many yeah. apps KDE makes, but there are some cool things that they do in terms of innovation and then bring them over to the other versions. So they do kind of have where they parallel development and then kind of share the code. So I think that that's a, a benefit. Can to we that. just combine them, Michael? I, can, can we put it out there to the KDE mm-hmm. community to please like focus on a single browser? I agree that there are some it's benefits to, to having it, a single gotta, <laughs> browser. Yeah. Okay, I agree. There should be yeah. one for each individual specific purpose. But anyway, um, Conqueror is cool because Conqueror is kind of um, a legacy application. And it's still being maintained, which is another big surprise for me when I played it, played around with it, because also it's like when we talked about previous applica- please previous browsers like uh, Sea Monkey and um, Pale Moon, they have uh, rendering issues for more modern websites. Where Conqueror seems to have all the up- latest updated features for the modern web. So I did a, some testing of JavaScript and loaded everything fine. So they are maintaining it for sure, but. Uh, Conqueror is really cool because it's got a lot of benefits in terms of it's got tons of plugins. It was the first browser that KDE made. And earlier in the show, you were talking about like the, you know, WebKit and who made WebKit and that sort of stuff. And this is really cool because Conqueror and the KDE project are essentially the founders of the modern web browser. They are mm. the developers who created something that essentially became everything else. So KHTML is the web engine that was created by the KDE team. And at that point, um, they were making Conqueror, and there weren't that many competitors in the browser space. And then they decided to not develop KHTML anyway, anymore for some reason. I don't remember why. But they uh, all the browsers that exist and all the web engines that exist are based on the code for KHTML. So if you have if you're using Gecko, if you're using WebKit or Blink or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's all can go back to KHTML and Conqueror. And I thought wow. that is an awesome thing to let people know about it because while Conqueror might not be the most modern browser now, it still has tons of features and it is modern. Mm-hmm. It is updated and uh, but it's it might not be the most modern, but it does have uh, some benefits and I'm really happy that it still exists because of that history for it because it's a very important thing to the, just the web in general. So basically, if you're using any browser at all, Chrome doesn't matter, it had yeah. some founding from this this here. This. Most user agents still say KHTML in their user agent. So if you go and check it, it'll, prob- it'll still probably say it no matter what browser you're using. Some of them remove it, but it's still there and on most of them. And the code is directly from... Uh, K, uh, KHTML back in the day. So all, no matter what browser you're using, there is some element of KDE attached to it. So mm. I like that. So you've got file um. management on FTP and SFTP. You got a full featured FTP client with split views built into this. So kind of like Dolphin in that way. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's set up embedded applications to preview like Ocular, Caligra for documents, Gwenview for pictures, different kinds of plugins in there. Conqueror is pretty cool browser there to check out. I just want KD to focus on one. That way I don't have to look at two different well, browsers. The, they actually list <laughs> out their features on Conqueror, which web page, which is nice too. Well, the thing about uh-huh. Conqueror is that it was the, essentially it was a suite just like Sea Monkey is and just like Vivaldi's becoming. But it yeah. like the whole thing about, you know, just like Dolphin, you said, um, Conqueror was before Dolphin. So yeah, it was they, the file manager. Yeah, it was the file manager and the browser and a bunch of other stuff that people were just using Conqueror to do most of everything. And uh, I, I do think that your, your point about just focusing on one is great. However, I will give an exception to Conqueror to continue mm-hmm. to exist regardless of what other browsers they're doing. Of course because, you will because it's KDE. It's the original. No, it's, it's because from the, of the cool it's, desktop, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> it's from the it's it's the history of Conqueror is what I'm saying. Yeah. Like it would be a shame for the KHTML um, origin browser to disappear is what I'm saying. I got you. Absolutely. I got you. Yeah, and and th- this is another browser that's the Swiss Army knife of browsers. Yeah. And but there's two features of of uh, Conqueror that I've always loved besides the file management feature is 
you can actually open an embedded version of the console terminal editor in the browser itself, which I've used many times. Yep. And I was just, as I was going through the research and, and was remembering that I use Conqueror to view ISO files from CD images and DVD images back in the day. It was yeah. great for that. It was a great file manager and very progressive, very ahead of its time. Very cool. Very true. So we've talked about the lesser known browsers out there. And of course, there's probably dozens more of lesser known browsers out there that we can't touch on because it'd have to be like a 24 hour episode to get through them all. <laughs> but we've also covered in the past Browse and yep. mm -hmm. Browse. I think we even almost made a T-shirt out of or we did make a T-shirt out of Browse or should we have. Did, we one. should have, but we might yeah. now. Who knows? It's a terminal-based browser, and uh, I see Dillo in the show notes as well. So here's yes. what I want to do. I want to know, I gave you all of this homework. This took hours for you guys to go through all of these. I know because it took me <laughs> hours yep. uh, to write it to begin with, but you still were like, but I got to go look at some other browsers as well. So Jill and Michael, I guess we'll start with you, Jill. What are some of the lesser known ones that I didn't cover here in the notes that you also like okay. or checked out? All my favorite terminal text-based web browsers, links. Okay. Links, L-I-N-K-S, links to, e-links, W3M. <laughs> and uh, the important thing about the original links, L-Y-N-X, is it's the oldest web browser still being actively maintained. And it was released in 1992. So I've been using it since before, uh, before the graphical web. <laughs> Nice. That was a thing. And also to the point of Dillo. <laughs> I Dillo. love Dillo. Dillo. <laughs> me and, me Never and Michael even heard were talking it. about it. It's something that is, I found on a, like a kind of a crazy experience. Like I didn't know about it, even though it's been around for a long time. I didn't know about it until I found this distro called Nano Linux. For those mm -hmm. who have not heard of it, it is ridiculously small that's why it's called nano linux everybody talks about like there's all these super lightweight small distros this thing is while it's running in full complete running everything it's 11 megabytes of ram mm -hmm. that's bloat that's bloat it's, it's bloat exactly yeah. right but <laughs> anyway when i was playing with it i saw their browser i was like how could it have a browser and then uh -huh. i and it loaded up dillo and that was yes. my introduction to dillo <laughs> <laughs> So Jill, tell us about, uh, by the way, links is one of the ones I see mentioned in our, our chat a lot. Yes. So a lot of people liking links out there to check oh, out. Of but course. Tell me about Dillo. What is Dillo's appeal and is it dead? Should anybody be still using it or? Yeah, it hasn't been updated in a long time. Okay. But I still like using it for reading web pages, on, honestly, with no distractions. And I've used it to read articles for our show notes and used it for going to Wikipedia, just because there's no ads, no distraction in your way, it's just the text. And um, it also, the other reason I love Dillo, it runs on all my a lot of my vintage computers. I, I have it on my 486 and even my 386. Yeah. And you could use it over dial-up. <laughs> it was the one of the first GUIs that you could, <laughs> GUI web browsers that you could use on dial-up. Maybe this would be a good browser for Wendy to use when we're doing the show since her internet connection is so slow. We uh, connect through Dillo. Well, there is a well, little bit of a Well, it doesn't have WebRTC. So. Yeah. Oh, darn. There's a little bit of a negative to Dillo, and yeah. it also doesn't really have much JavaScript, at, if, yeah. if any. It also doesn't have anything beyond HTML2 support. So it's not for everything. It, it isn't. It came out in 1999, and the first versions were based on an earlier browser actually called Armadillo, hence the name Dillo. Nice. And it was intended literally for older or slower computers and embedded systems. So it, it, browsers like this have an, you know, a very important use with older hardware. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I was not surprised when Jill said to use Dillo because of like having the, the her uh, Jill's museum. There's definitely going to be some browsers that are that it'll be or some computers that will be needed to have something like Dillo to run a browser. So yeah, yeah. It, In fact, it, the 486 I showed you that I built uh, that had Dillo. Nice. <laughs> it's it. just another <laughs> thing to add to our list of why we love Jill. Not only does she use all the older hardware and actually yeah. use it, not just own it, but has this love for older software, even software that is still updated older, like. 
but looks old. You like the patina, the classics, the <laughs> you have the appreciation <laughs> for what it was when it was made. And I think that's very cool in itself. And so any other browsers you guys had a chance to check out outside of the list that you want to mention, or do we wrap it up? Just one more thing about Browse. The reason why I'm a fan of Browse is because you talked about how it's a terminal browser, and it is, but it's also based on Firefox. So you have the Gecko engine inside of the terminal browser, so you can actually watch video from YouTube mm -hmm. or whatever, and even live streams inside of Browse. Now, you won't be able to see anything because it's in a terminal and it's like a mosaic kind of painting blocky. sort of that yeah. moves. Yeah. But uh, it's still kind of cool. <laughs> I love that. I used yeah. it, I used it uh, uh, with Jitsi, actually, with a WebRTC client. <laughs> and it looks like the video looks like instead of the uh, black and white AA library, it's the CACA libra library. That's what it looks like. <laughs> yeah. That is so cool. Browse <laughs> is a very cool terminal browser. And if you want to play with a fun browser, to me, yeah. that's my favorite terminal-based browser is Browse out there. It's just very cool. And the developers are very cool as well, because when we did that episode on Browse, they reached so out cool. uh, to us. So they're, they're very cool people over there. In any case, that's it. That's the summary of all of the new or lesser known web browsers <laughs> out there. Uh, some of them look new. Some of them are patina. I always use that word because they do that with cars, right? Some of them look yeah. uh, yes. very aged that's there. Um, but go Definitely. check them out. The community, go do this. Go check out some of these lesser known browsers. And if you find one you love, consider getting involved in their community because a lot of them are doing some amazing, amazing work out there. And I think it's very important that we have alternatives uh, to some of the mainstream browsers. But the most modern software that you can check out that we're going to talk about today is Bitwarden. That's the most modern software and the first extension you should install in any browser that you have. And this episode of Destination Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. So get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com slash DLN. You want to go to that URL to let them know we sent you there. That's bitwarden.com slash DLN. It's a password manager, allows you to have peace of mind knowing your online accounts are secure. Bitwarden provides you the tools to store all your passwords in a secure vault, auto-generate those passwords for you, and even automatically fill them in on the web pages. You can access your data across many types of devices like your web browser, mobile apps, desktop applications. We just talked about how important it is for browsers to be across all of the different OSs out there. Bitwarden has that. They can be on your mobile device. They could be on a Windows machine, a Linux machine, a Mac machine. Bitwarden is everywhere. It seals and encrypts your private data with end-to-end -end encryption before it ever leaves your device. So you know you're the only person with access to your data. Go to bitwarden.com slash deal in to get started and you can get started for free, but they also have a premium account and it's only, it's like $10 a year for their premium account. And you get to support this amazing software. And for $10 a year, you get a gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F or Duo, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden Authenticator, Priority Customer Support, and so much more. Make the smart move like so many in our community. Go to bitwarden.com slash deal in and get started right now. Thank you again to Bitwarden for sponsoring this episode of Destination Linux. So last year, we had the Mega Fest, And in it, we had a lot of stuff. We had gamings. We had just hanging out with the, the community. And it, it was so fun. It was a combination of multiple different types of events we did all together. And that's why it's called the Mega Fest. And in that, we uh, offered to donate a $500 to an open source project. And we allowed the community to provide suggestions and also vote on which one would win. So ultimately, what won was VLC, which is fantastic yeah. because VLC is a great media player. For those who have not used it, I'm, I'd be very shocked if anybody here who's listening to the show has never, never heard of VLC. But VLC is a free and open source cross-platform multimedia player and framework that plays pretty much everything. So if you yeah. want to do DVDs, CDs, even VCDs, if anybody has those still, maybe Jill does. Yeah. Or, yeah, of course she does. <laughs> Uh, or you, know, you can actually do streaming with it and all sorts of stuff. It's completely free, as we said, and it has lots of options to customize the skin, to do extensions, and all sorts of stuff. So this week, there's a latest version of VLC 3.0.17 in the news. It comes with a lot of great features to check out. So we're not going to be able to cover absolutely everything because there's just too much of it. But we're going to cover a few of them. So the biggest news is the better hardware decoding for AMD GPU users, which is yes. always great. Absolutely. 
and support for DTS HD LBR for low bitrate decoding. Also, they've added support for the new A4 CC for the AV1 E A the E dash AC3 GeoVision decoders. Like, there's there's a lot of initialisms in here. It feels like a different language when you read some <laughs> of the updates with VLC. Yeah. It's like yeah. it's a whole different language. If you're not into media, it's kind of like goes in one ear out the other. But it looks like a lot, and it looks really important. It de- it is, especially with yeah. the AV1 support, which is really great to see mm-hmm. because AV1 is a new format that's going to be taking over. Well, kind of uh, pretty much all video, so even streaming as well as just right. downloading videos. So having support for that is fantastic to see because it's a codec that is an open source codec, but it's also being backed by a lot of different uh, companies that are in, in this space. So I, I think that it's very, it's very great to see that AV1 is being put into so much effort on VLC. So VLC is one of those great projects that we, it's like one of the staples of open source. It really mm-hmm. is. There were a couple of things in here. Improved support for subtitles uh, with MP4, I think it was, which I think is really important. And oh, yeah. also supporting Android devices, I think, yeah. is really awesome. important. So you can install VLC on your Android device and use it there. We talk about wanting to have that seamless experience between your desktop and your mobile. Being able to use these same applications between both, I think, is really important. Yeah, absolutely. And in, in fact, I use VLC on my Android device. And oh, well, actually, I'm going to tell you a story. So I was using VLC for a very long time. I was a big fan of VLC. Before, when I was using Windows, it was like the only option you could really use. And this was many, many years ago. But I kind of moved, when I moved over to Linux, VLC was also there. So I was super excited. And then somewhere along the lines, there was some kind of artifacting experience that I had. And there was like some weird mosaic stuff happening. And just, it was just issues. So I switched to MPV into use as a player instead and that was many years i was using it for a while and then recently i was talking to someone about it and they were talking about how vlc has fixed all of those issues and it just works great now so i was like okay i'll go i'll go check it again and they were right vlc is back to being the awesome thing it is and i was also mentioned like well well here's some features that mpv can do that vlc can't and they're like no it can okay what about yes it can what a Yes. So apparently everything that I liked about MPV is now in VLC and well, a lot what's more. What's interesting too. about your mm-hmm. story, Michael, is I had the literal exact same experience. <laughs> <laughs> I can't pinpoint the exact time, but there was a moment like a year or so ago where VLC, basically every time I would play a video, it was artifacting it over or making weird colors over it or something was happening And I downloaded MPV and didn't have that problem. So I just switched to MPV entirely and never looked at VLC for a while. And then recently was like, I wonder if VLC ever fixed that and installed it and used it. And I just love VLC. It's kind of gives me that old school feel too. like there's nostalgia attached to it. I mean, it looks modern, but there's just nostalgia attached to me in VLC. I want to use it everywhere because I just love VLC. And I hate that they went through that issue. It sounds like we both ran into it at that point, but they fixed mm-hmm. it since. And a lot of the stuff they're working on here is super important. So Jill, you also do something really cool with VLC and streaming with mobile. So tell us about that. Yeah. So I've used VLC for years for uh, streaming on mobile from from uh, YouTube streams and other, other uh, platform live streams, just so I wouldn't get all, I have to use the YouTube app and get all the ads. <laughs> it's really nice. And sometimes I've even recorded them with it because that's a feature that VLC has is that you can uh, uh, record uh, any video format you want and re-encode it and transport it. It's it's just amazing for that. It's really the Swiss Army knife of video players. <laughs> It really is. So you'll take a YouTube URL, you'll stream it through VLC instead, and that removes the ads out? Yeah, correct. Oh, that's like a super <laughs> tip there. I mean, and- listeners, you don't do that because then we won't get money from the ads, but we can do that because, well, that's not fair. Yeah, you can yeah, do it I, That's very I, cool. I, I like get getting ads. the ads. In fact, I, play, I pay for YouTube premium, so I am paying for ads. There you go. Okay. That's- <laughs> That's, That's the right way to do it, Jill. That's the oatmeal oat style. I like it. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, there you go. VLC is doing lots of cool things. If you haven't checked out VLC, if you ran into the issue like Michael and I have and left it for a while because there were some issues, go check it out again. They've got a new version coming out. Lots of cool stuff in there. Our software spotlight this week is Git Cola. We all love mm -hmm. Git, but managing repos gets tedious and difficult the more complex your projects become. I mean, look at the Michael AI I have out there on GitHub. You should check it out right now. It's 140 lines of code. How do I manage that? Get How cool. do you manage that? It's, I mean, <laughs> the amount of updates you have to do constantly to make yeah. sure it's all accurate. It's, yeah, It's unbearable. It's unbearable the amount of updates. But Git Cola really is cool. If you've got a <laughs> lot of projects out there, Git Cola comes into play in providing a simple, powerful, and feature-rich GUI for Git that provides an easy way to interact with Git repositories. So you can fetch, push, pull, stash, stage, unstage, commit, check out, merge, and unmerge. It's all there built into <laughs> this tool. Interesting story. When I was looking for a software spotlight this week, I came across a couple of Git tools, and I thought this would be great. I've, my Git is getting a little bit bigger, a little bit out of control. I want something to manage in. I've been using Sublime a lot. I don't want to have to pay for a separate Sublime merge to do the Git stuff for me. But I kept coming across ones that were deprecated and not updated. And so it took me like a while to finally find Git Cola. And this is a updated modern package that had all the features that I was looking for, really powerful interface. So consider checking it out. And Git, by the way, is become a mandatory skill set for programming jobs. So if you have not learned Git, most of the corporations I deal and interact with in my other life, the non-DOS geek life, Git is one of the things that they require you learning and be efficient at. So this is kind of a cool way to get started with Git in the GUI, but you also want to learn it in the terminal as well. But this will cut out a lot of steps in, in learning some of the features there. Yeah, I've, I've not tried to get color myself, but I'm looking forward to it because I am looking for something that would allow me to get ready to giddy up. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> A dad joke, Michael. Giddy it's up. Necessary. Really? At this <sighs> point, it's necessary. <laughs> So next we're through the tip of the week and we have actually two tips this week. So they're going to be related to your home folder. First up, let's talk about the tilde key or the tilde character. That's the squiggly line above the tab key on ANSI keyboards, which is the US standard keyboard. If you have a different keyboard, then I don't know where it is. Good luck. Anyway, <laughs> this is a, a shorthand for your home folder. So if you ever see a terminal tutorial that uses this symbol, it's talking about your home folder. So instead of doing slash home slash username, you just do the tilde key slash, and that is the same, basically the same thing as a variable. So you don't actually have to type in that whole thing, regardless of you know how long your username is or whatever. So in some commands, you would need to specify a path. Instead of putting the slash home slash username, you can just put tilde. And also some tutorials you may see use a, a command cd space tilde to get back to your home folder. But you can skip that actually by just doing cd because cd space and tilde and cd nothing is the same thing going back to your home folder. So if you're navigating around in your terminal because you need to install something or check new configuration changes or anything like that, just use cd to get back to your home folder and be, you know, home sweet home. I would like mm -hmm. to fact check that. I just opened my terminal and typed CD space nothing, and it okay. said command invalid. Michael. Okay, that, yes, don't, just, you just CD. That's it. You don't have to type the word nothing. That's probably yeah. not the best. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. That's where I went My wrong. bad on my the bad. phrasing. My bad on the phrasing. Yeah, okay. You know, I've been using CD for years instead of tilde because I just found it. It's quicker because I don't have to type shift and tilde. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I just, yeah. yeah, and I've been. And you don't have CD to look up what the heck a tilde key day. is. Just yeah. CD. Yeah. <laughs> it's the squiggly line. Yeah, the, the squiggles. squiggles. The squiggles. <laughs> so, in our announcements this week, which are hooked up to us by Der Hans, who sends us all the conferences that we need to let you all know about. So, Der Hans got his own segment in the show just by helping us out. I mean, how cool is that? Right? It's the Der Hans segment. <laughs> I'll just call it that. The Der Hans announcement section. We got FOSS Asia in April. April 7th through the 9th, Linux Fest Northwest, which is virtual, April 22nd through the 24th. PinguiCon, April 22nd through the 24th. Linux App Summit, April 29th through the 30th. Red Hat Summit, May 10th through the 11th. And Scale, July 28th through the 31st. Rumor is Jill's going to be at Scale. There's another rumor that's going around. And by the way, you'll look for the penguin hat to see Jill. You'll know that's Jill. There's another rumor that Michael may show up to Scale. 
The uh-huh. might. I Ooh. might. It depend. It depends on some factors that I don't know just yet what those are. But we will find out later on in the yeah, year I- if I will be able to make. But but um, I'm hoping to because that'll be fun. Yes. Yeah. And maybe I'll get to wear the Jill hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. Jill, do you have an extra hat for Michael? I have another penguin hat, but not this one was specially made for just me. Just <laughs> make him wear a penguin hat. I don't care which one. Just as long as it's as long as the penguin hat. Other penguin okay. hats. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Unfortunately, I won't be able to make it. I uh, charge for me to show up my fifty thousand dollar fee. They weren't willing to pay. I don't know why. <laughs> um, but no, I actually won't be. But Michael and Jill, there. That would be awesome. There. <laughs> So a big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening to Destination Linux. However you do it, we love your faces. We're here every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern live at DLNLive.com. The best part, everyone is invited to watch the recording of Destination Linux each and every week, and we can't wait to see you in the chat. We also have our glorious patrons that help us do this show, and we uh, in between segments we have conversations about things. We also have the unedited versions of of the show that they can check out by when they when they sign up by going to destinationlinux.org slash Patreon or destinationlinux.org slash sponsors. And they also get to join us in the 67,000 square foot digital stadium <laughs> for the patron post show. And it happens every week following the show. So go to destinationlinux.org to get more information. And also go to dealinstore.com to get some swag. We have a lot of cool stuff. We have t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, hats, stickers, uh, coasters, all sorts of stuff there at dealinstore.com. You can get it for all the different uh, shows on the network and also the 33% more Jill stuff is there. (laughs) So check that out. So dealinstore.com. Also, real quick, speaking of our patrons, one of our patrons mentioned that the OpenSUSE conference is June 2nd through the 4th. So check that one out as well. I've been on OpenSUSE Tumbleweed for the last few weeks. So, I, mean, I need to show up to the OpenSUSE conference. Yeah, you do. That's yeah. going to be in Germany, yeah. so enjoy that, a- Bill. <laughs> yeah. We'll see if they're willing to pay the show up fee. <laughs> yeah. And also make sure to check out all our amazing shows here on the Destination Linux Network. We have the Pseudo Show, This Week in Linux, the DOS Geek Channel, Linux Out Loud, Hardware Addicts, GameSphere, and put your cowboy hats on and join our Saturday Linux user group, Linux Saloon. That was a lot of fun last night. We, we definitely had fun talking about App Image Launcher. That was a really cool yeah, episode. It's a great discussion. So everybody have a great week and remember that the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. Woo! Love you. Most of you. Most. Every time. Every time. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of want to leave that in the edited version now. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>